Finish your bisque and put away your snake, you kinky bastards, because it's episode three of American Horror Story, and I think I just shit my pants. The episode begins with Hot Satan finishing his interviews to determine who is worthy of being admitted to sanctuary. He says he's responsible for the seeds which will save mankind, and tells Galant, Timmy, and Mallory that they will be saved. Galant feels sorry for killing his nana, but Langdon tells him she died peacefully in her sleep. Then again, you can never really trust the spawn of Satan. He tells them that he has a power called Night Vision of the Soul, in which he can look into the places people want to keep hidden. Mallory, looking more and more like a kid from Whoville is also interviewed by Langdon even though she's a grey. Langdon can sense she wants to slit Coco's throat for how she's been treated by her. He's also surprised to see Dina Stevens there. Apparently they have a history. She says she's not powerful enough to stop whatever it is he has planned. Does he know that she is somehow related to the witches? And if so, why would he want her to join Sanctuary? He says, you're exactly the type of soul I'm looking for to build my new world. He's not saving them, he needs their souls. We'll get into more of that in a bit. We learn that Andre is Dina's son and that he thinks his mother is evil, even though it was likely her who paid for him and his boyfriend for their outpost tickets. Langdon tells Mallory that the rules of the old world, the rules that were honored in the breach, are over. This line, the breach, is super interesting because it hints at a war between the forces of hell and either angels or witches. But now since the world has been decimated, new rules and new conflicts between those forces will surely arise. He tells her that he wants people that will not only taste from the forbidden fruit, but cut the fucking tree down. Forbidden fruit being the name of this episode and a reference to the story of Adam and Eve, the snake and apple imagery making it even more evident. Mallory tells Langdon that it feels like someone is inside her, wanting to claw its way out. She tries to leave when he stops her, but she unleashes a power so fearsome that it jettisons him across the room. He retaliates by showing his true form, an old man, perhaps some sort of demon, or even his father, Satan, manifesting itself through him for a brief moment. Mallory retaliates again, exploding the fireplace, igniting the room in a fireball, much to Langdon's surprise. This is the first time all season Langdon loses his composure. He no longer is his usual calm self, rather surprised, not having the answers. He asks her, who are you? And judging by her look, she doesn't know either. Langdon performs a satanic ritual similar to the one Galant saw him do in his dreams in episode 2. He asks for power from his father, who is likely the lord of hell, Satan. He tells him that he thought he destroyed them all, but one survived. We're led to believe he's talking about witches, but by the end of the episode we know many of them are still alive, and with him knowing Dina was one of them, is Mallory something different? Not a witch, but an angel. She even says to Langdon, I have no dark places. An angel would be the most logical this season, providing a great foil to the Satanism of Michael Landon and the cooperative. As he continues the ritual, the blood begins to boil and snakes emerge. Looks like they didn't come from the pipes or ventilation shafts like Mead guessed in episode 2. Something takes over Langdon, his eyes turn jet black, and he says the words Ave Satanus, which is Latin for Hail Satan. Ave Satanus. In a series of kick-ass flashbacks, we follow young Mead on Halloween, dressed coincidentally like a robot. At her first stop, she's given, guess what, a forbidden fruit. Fast forward to her first date watching Rosemary's Baby, a movie about a pregnant woman giving birth to the devil. There's even a dude wearing devil horns in the back. Fast forward again to her first kill as an agent for Mossad, the International Intelligence Agency for Israel. Halloween seems to bring back her memories, and if we remember from the dates on the emails in episode 2, Halloween is just around the corner. We find Mead is talking to Venable, letting her know about her being a robot, questioning if all of her memories were simply programmed. She recollects one memory in particular of taking care of a little blonde boy, but the memory is such a blur. Is she referring to young Michael Langdon from season one's murder house? Venable tells her Langdon can't be trusted to take the right people to sanctuary, and when Mead finds out Venable wasn't chosen to go, they concoct a plan. Kill them all, steal his computer, and find out where sanctuary is. We're finally going topside where the pus and blister filled cannibals are having a beach party. And look who it is from episode one, Coco boyfriend Brock, but something tells me she's not going to approve of his makeover. He asks them if they've heard of a bunker for the rich when he's ambushed and fights them off, his shotgun making quick work of them. 
A carriage, similar to the one Langdon came in in episode one, rushes away. But it can't be Langdon since his horses were eaten at the end of that episode. It must be from someone else in the cooperative. An alarm goes off alerting Venable of a perimeter breach. It's the carriage and inside is a box. But underneath, Brock hides using the carriage like a Trojan horse. In the decontamination chamber, the box is checked for radioactivity and is deemed clean. Inside are dozens of apples. Venable thinks Langdon sent them to prove to the survivors what will be waiting for them in Sanctuary. She orders the Fist to take care of the horses while Mead offers a solution to their Langdon problem. Hold a party and offer the poison apples as a gift, killing every last person in Outpost 3 before taking care of Langdon. Remember it was when Eve ate from the forbidden fruit that she and Adam were banished from the Garden of Eden and lost eternal life. Topside, Brock stabs the Fist, stealing her keycard to gain access to the outpost. Mallory stares at the fire, questioning who she really is as dissonant violin chords play similar to those found in The Shining. Venable calls an emergency meeting to announce their Victorian ball-themed Halloween party. With all they've been through, they deserve a time to relax and let loose. Galant does Coco's hair in what has to be one of the most outrageous hairstyles I've ever seen when Mallory asks if she can use Coco's lubes, Louis Vuitton's, to make a mask. And if you know Coco, you know that ain't a go-go. She thinks the party is where they'll announce who gets chosen for Sanctuary, and no way in hell is Mallory going to get chosen. Mallory tells them how she made the fire explode in Langdon's office, kind of like the Dark Phoenix, a reference to the X-Men character Jean Grey who has telekinetic powers. Coco berates Mallory, telling her to prove it. Uh, there's a fire right there, bitch! But Mallory can't seem to harness her power. The party has begun, and Mead brings in the forbidden fruit so that everyone can bob for apples. A nod to season one and Zachary Quinto's character, who prepared bobbing for apples on Halloween in the murder house. Venable explains the importance of All Hallows' Eve, when the boundary between this world and the other thins. Coincidentally, also the time when the boundary between the outpost and the outside world thins. Bonus points if you saw Timmy's vest with the patches. Coco dances with who she thinks is Langdon, explaining how marvelous it will be when she's taken to Sanctuary. As a gesture of goodwill, she offers to give him something she never gave her boyfriend. I'm talking about analingus. She brings him back to her room and, sorry, we don't get to see his radioactive penis. Brock reveals himself and Coco feigns happiness, saying how she's so glad to see him again. But he's not having it and stabs her in the face. Mead can't seem to find Coco or the Fist anywhere and suggests to Venable that they stop their plan. There's too many witnesses. Venable says they must go forward and we learn they use the snake venom to concoct their poison. She makes a toast to good fortune and everyone eats, before we're treated to the American horror story equivalent of the Red Wedding. The denizens of Outpost 3 convulse, vomiting up blood and bits of apple, till every last one of them is dead. Worst party ever. Venable and Mead inspect the dead, reveling in their victory before heading off to Langdon. At gunpoint, they tell Langdon they're making the selections now, and in a cruel twist of malice, Langdon tells her that she passed. She'll be accepted to Sanctuary. She instructs Mead to shoot, but Mead suddenly turns the gun and... <laughs> Venable is killed. Mead's been under Langdon's control the whole time. Not only that, he was the one who came up with the poison apple plan. We learned she was made by the Cooperative Research and Development Department, a prototype of a woman who took care of Langdon as a child. Langdon is the blonde hair boy she referenced earlier in the episode, but who is she modeled on? The prevailing theory at the moment is she's based off Jessica Lang's character Constance from season one, the woman we see here taking care of young Michael Langdon. Then we're treated to the best part of the series so far, the return of the witches, Cordelia Good, Myrtle Snow, and Madison Montgomery. Cordelia breathes life into what she calls their sisters, Coco, Mallory, and Dina, resurrecting them before Madison tells Mallory, Surprise, bitch. I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. But the question remains, how does Madison know Mallory? And is it connected to that thing inside her, clawing to get out? Is it Zoe from season three, potentially alluding to the spirits of Misty and Queenie in the bodies of Coco and Dina? Or is it something else entirely? Madison isn't referring to Mallory herself, but the thing inside her, the angel. Notice also how Mallory took off her glasses after being resurrected, seemingly curing her vision problems. If you recall from season three, after Madison was resurrected, it cured her of her heart murmur. And what will happen to the others? Surely this isn't the last we'll see of Galant. My guess is that since this was all part of Michael's plan, he now has access to their souls. So we shouldn't count out that he'll be doing some resurrecting of his own.
But this also calls into question the other bunkers. Were they overrun like Langdon and Venable said, or were their souls taken by him? If the bunker they're in used to be an all-boys school, is it possible the cooperative is tied to the warlocks, male practitioners of evil magic? This would provide a foil to the all-girls witches coven in Season 3. So are we looking at a battle between witches and the powers of hell, or that of angels and demons? Perhaps some combination of both. We'll just have to tune in next week to find out. Hey everyone, I hope you like this video. As always, I hope you'll like, subscribe, share all that fun stuff, and check out my other videos. And don't forget, Daddy loves you very much.